Wish you all a very good evening and welcome to the today's evening symposium on airway oscillometry, new perspectives on pulmonary function testing. I am Dr. Sandeep Salvi and on behalf of the Indian Chest Society as the Vice President, I welcome you all to this uh, very important uh, webinar. We are very fortunate to have uh, Professor Dr. Brian Lipworth uh, from the Scottish Centre for Respiratory Research uh, from the University of Dundee in Scotland uh, to give us some new insights into a very important diagnostic test called oscillometry, airway oscillometry. Uh, during these COVID times when spirometry, which uh, is still regarded as the gold standard diagnostic test for obstructive airway diseases, uh, because of the potential for aerosol generation, uh, spirometry is not recommended for routine use uh, in today's clinical practice. But there seems to be an alternative test that does not generate the aerosol. And this is the airway oscillometry, the force oscillation technique or the impulse oscillometer that uh, uses sound waves to measure uh, airway obstruction. So we're going to be talking a lot about this uh, today. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this program that is endorsed by the Indian Chess Society is a very important educational activity uh, to share this knowledge with all uh, the practicing pulmonologists and the budding chess physicians of our country. I will be introducing uh, Dr. Brian Lipworth a little later on uh, at the end of my presentation and uh, would like to sincerely acknowledge the help of uh, Thoracis and Shilla for having uh, supported this uh, program. What I'm going to do over the next uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so, 15 minutes or so is to share with you the beauty and the power of breath. Why do we breathe? Why is it essential for us to breathe? What does it actually do to the human body? How has the lung evolved as an organ uh, to fulfill these essential requirements of the human body? I'm going to share with you some very exciting facts and figures uh, that would be an introduction to the talk by Professor Brian Lipworth. Uh, I bring to you greetings from my institute called the Palmo Care Research and Education Foundation, uh, situated in the city of Pune. What is the first thing that we do when we are born? We take the first breath. Isn't that interesting? Because life is defined from the time you take your first breath. Before that, it is not called life. Uh, even when you're in your mother's womb, uh, it is not defined as life. Life starts with the first breath that you take. And what is the last thing that you do before you die? You take the last breath. Life is a period between the first breath and the last breath. Isn't that fascinating that life is equated to breathing? If you stop breathing, you're not alive. If you are breathing well, you're alive. That's how important uh, this very simple process of breathing is to keep us uh, alive. Out of the three basic necessities of life, all of us probably give this the most importance, the food that we eat. We cannot live without food for a few weeks. And uh, if I ask you, what is the quantum of food that is necessary for us to keep ourselves fit and well? Uh, Many of you would give answers in different formats. So some of you may answer in terms of calories, but if I ask you to give an answer in terms of simple weight, how many kilograms of food do you eat every day? Or how much do you need to eat every day to keep yourself fit and well? So the breakfast, lunch, dinner, and maybe an evening snack would account for about maybe up to two kilograms of food every day. That's, that is what is required for the human body. The second basic necessity of life is water. And on a daily basis, each one of us needs to drink around two to three liters every day to keep ourselves fit and well. Now we have a lot of importance for these two basic necessities of life because we have to work hard for it. We have to work hard for the food that we eat. We have to work hard for the clean drinking water. The third basic necessity of life, which is perhaps the most important one, uh, does not receive the recognition that it, that it deserves, the air that we breathe. And you may perhaps be surprised to know that on a daily basis, each one of us needs to breathe 10,000 liters of air. 
Isn't it amazing? Compare that to the two kilograms of the food and the three liters of water, we need to breathe 10,000 liters of air every day. And one of the most important ingredients of air that keeps us fit and well is this molecule called oxygen. You may perhaps not know this, but oxygen provides us with a 90% of our nutritional energy, which is 10% coming from the food that we eat and the water that we drink. Isn't that amazing? 90% of the energy comes from the oxygen that we breathe. Uh, if I ask you, uh, what is the energy currency of the cell? All of you will certainly answer this as adenosine triphosphate or ATP. And if I ask you, uh, how much ATP is produced by the human body every day? Many of you perhaps may not know this answer, but uh, you produce as much amount of ATP that is equivalent to your body weight on a daily basis. So if you're, if you're weighing 70 kilograms, you would uh, generate 70 kilograms of ATP every day. Obviously it is used almost instantaneously by the cells, but that is a quantum of energy that is required by the human body to keep ourselves fit and well. And the amazing fact is 90% of this comes from the oxygen that we breathe. What is so special about this molecule called oxygen that it generates 90% of the body's energy? It was a question that was asked to me in a talk that I gave to an undergraduate medical class. And to be honest, I literally had to scratch my head to give the answer. How does oxygen generate energy? Does it burn inside the cell? Does it provide fire? Does it, does it provide heat? How does it generate 90% of the energy? And the answer came from a very simple seven standard chemistry book. The, uh, the inner ring of the oxygen molecule has two electrons. The outer ring of the oxygen molecule, which should have had eight electrons, has only six electrons, which means that there are two empty slots. That means oxygen can accept electrons. And it is this very simple fact, simple principle, that helps in generating 90% of the body's energy. The food that we eat uh, that contains carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, you know, the carbon molecules are broken down in the cell. And uh, then all this goes into the mitochondria where further breakdown occurs and a lot of electrons are generated. Up and until somebody accepts those electrons, the energy that is associated with the food cannot be released. So oxygen acts as the final acceptor of electrons in the mitochondrial electron transport chain. And the moment it accepts the electrons, energy is released in the form of ATP. That is, the, uh, that is the, prin the, the principle of how oxygen generates energy. Just to show you an example, if you burn one molecule of glucose in the absence of oxygen, anaerobic glycolysis, you would produce two molecules of ATP. But if you burn the same molecule of glucose in the presence of oxygen, you would generate 36 molecules of ATP. That is the amplifying power of oxygen. Free fatty acids need a lot of oxygen uh, to, to, to be used to, to produce ATP. And in fact, one molecule of a free fatty acid, such as palmitic acid, uh, releases about 132 molecules of ATP. But it cannot do that unless there is a lot of oxygen present inside the cell. So that is how oxygen generates 90% of the body. Not only that, but if you look at these structural components of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, there is always an oxygen molecule in all of these. Why, why that? Even water molecule contains oxygen. So oxygen is an essential structural component of all the basic necessities of life. Proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and even the water that is so very important for us. You may perhaps not be aware that oxygen in the body accounts for 70% of your body weight. So if you are, uh, say, 70 kilograms, 55 kilograms of that would only be because of oxygen that is present in a body. Obviously, a large part of that is because of the water that contains oxygen. And we know that 65% uh, of the body weight is because of, uh, of water. So, But nonetheless, oxygen is a very, very important component uh, of the human body. If you do not perform any activity and sleep for 24 hours, which I'm sure many of you all do, isn't it? 
your body would still need to burn 500 liters of oxygen every 24 hours. If you perform your routine day-to-day -day activities, like what you perhaps have been doing today, going to work, seeing patients, going here and there, your body would need to consume 1,000 liters of oxygen uh, every 24 hours. And if you're an athlete who does regular uh, you know, tough exercises like running and swimming and jogging, your body would need to burn 1,500 liters of oxygen on a daily basis. And in order to provide this, uh, this so-called life-giving molecule to the human body, nature has entrusted this responsibility to this beautiful organ called as the lung, situated in the thoracic cage. The main function of the lung is to nourish the body with oxygen. And for that, we need to breathe 10,000 liters of air every day. We all know that 21% of that is oxygen. So out of the 2,100 liters of oxygen that enter inside the lungs, the lungs soak in around, around 1,000 liters of oxygen and push it into the circulation so that the other cells and the tissues can be nourished with this light being force. If you look at the architecture of the lung, uh, you have essentially two components. You have the ventilation part of the lung, and then you have the perfusion part of the lung. Uh, the ventilation part of the lung is the one that uh, pulls in the air in and out uh, on a continual basis for the whole life. Uh, <clears throat> the 10,000 liters of air that you breathe, they enter inside the main trachea. <clears throat> and then the trachea divides uh, like the branches of a tree uh, around 23 times uh, until it ends up in the alveoli. Somebody has even counted the number of airways in the human lung very recently. And there are about 40,000 such branching airways in the human lung. Uh, as I said, 10,000 liters of air go in and out of this uh, airway branching pattern and ultimately ends up in the alveoli. The, uh, the alveolus is the portion where the oxygen enters into the blood circulation. There are 600 layers of alveoli tightly packed inside the thoracic cage. The alveoli have the size of a dodecahedron. Uh, that means it has 12 sides, the perfect size uh, so that you know you don't leave any space between the alveoli. Uh, nature has you know made this twelve-sided alveoli just like the seeds of a pomegranate. Uh, you know they also have twelve sides, and that ensures that in a in a in a in, a, in, in an enclosed space, uh, the maximum number of uh, seeds or the alveoli that can be fitted in uh, can be done so by having the twelve-sided shape. So that's the dodecahedron that the alveoli have, and. Uh, Surprisingly, you know, the amount of blood that flows through the lungs every day is also 10,000 liters. So isn't that amazing? 10,000 liters of air in and out, 10,000 liters of blood in and out of the lungs every 24 hours, only in, only in order to nourish the human body with uh, oxygen. And if you open all the alveoli and spread it across, the surface area would be around 75 to 100 square meters. That's almost the size of a tennis court. That is a surface area that is present inside our own lungs. We have a tennis court size surface area where oxygen diffusion occurs uh, so, as to, so that you know, we are all well nourished with this simple molecule. Oxygen is transported from the alveoli to the different parts of the body attached to this protein called hemoglobin that is present inside the red blood cell. And there are some amazing facts over here. Every red blood cell, you know, this tiny red blood cell, tiny microscopic red blood cell has 300 million hemoglobin molecules stuffed inside it. You know, it needs those 300 million molecules, 300 million hemoglobin molecules. And for that, it has even got rid of the nucleus. It is one of the only few enucleated cells uh, in the body where the nucleus is absent. And why did the red blood cell get rid of the nucleus? Because it wants to utilize that space to pack in as many hemoglobin molecules as possible. Because this is the molecule that transport oxygen uh, from the lungs to the other parts of the body. So uh, 300 million hemoglobin molecules in each red blood cell. And let me share with you some another stunning fact. If you count all the cells in the body, from the tip of your hair to the tip of your toe, every single cell from all organs, the total number of cells uh, comes to around 37 trillion cells, 37 0.2 trillion with a T. Out of these 37 trillion cells, 25 trillion are the red blood cells that are circulating in the blood. 
Isn't that amazing? Every second, 2 million red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow, and every second, 2 million red blood cells are destroyed. Look at the amount of investment that the human body has made in order to transport oxygen from the lungs to every single cell and tissue in the body. This is the beauty of the entire system that nature has developed. In fact, the major nutrient that circulates in the blood is oxygen. You know, if you, if you take 100 ml of blood and just let it settle down in a test tube, uh, the red blood cells would occupy around uh, 45 uh, ml of that, 45%. Uh, that is called as a hematocrit. And uh, that is a portion of the blood that actually transports oxygen. So about 40% or 45% of the blood is actually transporting this very important nutrient to all the cells of the body. And obviously it transports other, or other important nutrients as well. The lung also performs some other functions. It, you know, the, it encloses the heart, gives it a nice soft covering from all the sides, maintains your acid-base balance. Uh, it, it's a route for water loss and heat elimination, uh, filters of small blood clots, uh, you know, helps generate sound so that I can speak to you what I'm doing now, and so many other things. I mean, those are the so-called non-respiratory functions of the lung. But there is one non-respiratory function of the lung that actually gave me a shock. And this was a paper that was published in Nature a few years ago. The lung has an organ that produces hematopoietic cells. In fact, 50% of the circulating platelets in your blood originate from the lung. Did you know this? There are these hematopoietic cells that are situated in the lung. And the lung is a site that generates, uh, especially the platelets. 50% of the circulating platelets. Uh, if you have to measure a lung function, is if your lung is functioning properly or not, you have to ask yourself a few questions. Are the airways patent? Because that's an important component of the way the lung functions. If the airways are not patent, obviously uh, the lung would not be functioning as efficiently as it should. And we all know that uh, diseases that affect the airways that cause narrowing, what we call as obstructive airway diseases, are one of the most common manifestations of lung diseases. So if you have to find an answer to this question, are the airways patent? You need to have an objective test. And these are the tools that will give you the answer. So we know that spirometry is a gold standard diagnostic test for obstructive airway disease. But then we also have something called impulse oscillometry and force oscillation technique, a topic that we're going to cover today. Then we have the body box plethysmograph that also helps you understand patency of the airways by measuring the airway resistance and airway conductance. And then you have the peak flow meter, a very simple tool that gives you some indication of the patency of your airways. Then the next question that you need to ask to measure lung function is, are the airways hypersensitive? You know that asthma is a disease that is associated with hypersensitive airways or hyper-responsive airways. And if you have to measure that part of your lung function, uh, then you have the methacholine challenge test, and then you have the exercise challenge test, and so on. So this, these are the bronchial challenge tests that will help you find out the answer for this question. Are the airways inflamed? And we know that uh, this is an important component of asthma, where the inflammation is, a, is an important part of the uh, process that occurs in the airways. So if you want to find an, find, uh, an answer to this question, either you do sputum induction and uh, you, you get the sputum out and quantify the number of cells, and look at the type of cells that are present in the sputum, that will give you an indication of the type of inflammation that is present in the airways. Or you could do a simple, a simple test called the fractionated exhaled nitric oxide test. Uh, that's a reasonably good test that measures uh, the presence of eosinophils in the, air, in the airways. What about lung mechanics? Uh, uh, body box plethysmography, uh, PI max, PE max are the tools that will help you find that answer. Uh, what is the total area that is available for the, uh, for the gas exchange? Uh, you have the body box plethysmograph that will tell you the value of the total lung capacity or the fractional residual capacity, uh, which cannot be measured by spirometry. So that will tell you the, uh, the answer for this. Or you have the helium washout and the radiology that can help you understand the volume of air that your lungs can uh, have. Is the lung diffusion apparatus uh, functioning well? Uh, 
you have the DLCO test of the diffusing lung coefficient for carbon monoxide. And then you have the six minute walk test, which is an indirect measure of uh, that. So these are all the, all the tools that we need to use in a clinic. If we have to find an answer to this question about are the lungs functioning well. Now, uh, just the three important ones are the airways patent, we have spirometry, then you have the IOS or the airway oscillometry or the FOT, uh, are the sufficient number of alveoli, you have the body box, the diffusion apparatus functioning well, you have the DLC or test. So these are the three basic tests that totally comprise the pulmonary function test. Spirometry has always remained the gold standard diagnostic test for obstructive airway disease. Uh, however, the, uh, the use of spirometry in uh, you know, in the whole country is uh, quite small for various reasons. It's, a, it's not an easy test to perform. Uh, it, it needs that the patient should uh, blow very forcefully into the device and for as long as possible. So it's an effort dependent test. And that's a challenge to, uh, you know, use in the clinical setting. It requires a lot of good patient cooperation. Uh, doctors do not find it easy to interpret the report. And perhaps it's not a very sensitive tool for diagnosing small airways obstruction. So these are the drawbacks that we have for spirometry, not to mention that it is an aerosol generating procedure. And especially in a COVID times, uh, this is a test that is not recommended for routine use uh, in the clinic. Uh, and therefore we need to look for alternatives, the tests that do not generate aerosols. Uh, just the last couple of slides to sort of introduce the topic for Professor Brian Lipworth. I have divided the airways into three portions, as you can see in this graph over here. The A is the large airways, the B portion is the medium sized airways, and the C portion is the small sized airways. And the reason why I'm showing this is uh, we know that asthma is a disease that can affect all the three portions of the airways. Uh, we, uh, and, but there is a phenotype of asthma that particularly affects uh, the C portion of the airways, or the small airways. And this is called as the small airways disease phenotype, SAD. And uh, recently, there has been a lot of interest in this particular phenotype of asthma that uh, predominantly uh, affects the small airways. And this is a paper by uh, Omar Usmani and Dave Singh from, uh, from Imperial College. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a review of literature that tells us what is the proportion of uh, small airways obstruction in patients with asthma. And as you can see here, about half of the asthmatics uh, shows predominantly small airways obstruction. Now, that's the portion of the airway that is very difficult to measure in terms for, of diagnosis, and perhaps uh, not, uh, not very easy to even target these small, uh, the small airways in terms of the inhaled drugs. Most of the inhaled medications have particle sizes of between two to five microns, and a uh, very, 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 very small portion of that actually reaches the small airways. But in clinical practice, we know that asthma uh, can also start in the small airways, to start with, uh, but spirometry may not necessarily pick it up. And this particular phenotype of asthma uh, is, is, is got a very unique set of clinical uh, presentations. It's difficult to treat asthma. Uh, it's a more severe form of asthma that we see. Uh, these asthmatics usually have more uncontrolled asthma, the predominant nighttime awakenings. Asthma that is obese, associated with obesity or exercise induced or smoking associated are all predominantly associated with small airways. And it seems to be more common in females. So, uh, you know, this, this phenotype of asthma is getting more recognition and uh, we need to diagnose these small airways uh, asthma very uh, early and uh, efficiently. COPD is a disease that predominantly affects the small airways. And we know that uh, that's the portion of the lung that is, that is mainly affected in COPD. So if you have to make an early diagnosis of COPD, we know that... Uh, the ratio that is used to define obstructive airway disease, FE1 upon FEC, may not necessarily be sensitive enough to pick up uh, early COPD. And it, you know, it only picks up COPD when the disease is a little more advanced. So can we have a diagnostic test that will easily pick up the function of the small airways? Uh, is something that people have been working on this for a long time. And uh, that's where uh, the, the new device called airway oscillometry uh, as a very important uh, test that uh, has evolved over a period of time. I genuinely believe that it is a test that is going to uh, you know, be more important than spirometry in early diagnosis of asthma, early diagnosis of COPD, and even uh, in evaluating the response to treatment. Uh, I see this as the future of lung function testing. 
and moreover, because uh, it is not an aerosol generating test, so uh, should be uh, an ideal test to perform. Uh, with this, I would like to stop my presentation and I would like to invite uh, Professor Brian Lipworth. But before I do that, uh, uh, I, so, okay, let me introduce Dr. Brian Lipworth. Very, very fortunate to have him uh, today here. Uh, Professor Brian Lipworth is one of the eminent respiratory scientists in the world. He has an index of 84, which is an extremely high, uh, you know, it tells him that, tells us that he's a very, very, uh, one of the topmost respiratory scientists in the world. Uh, he's the professor of allergy and pulmonology at the University of Dundee. He heads the Scottish Center for Respiratory Research and Clinical, and is the clinical professor of allergy and pulmonology at the Nine Wells Hospital uh, and Medical School in Dundee. He has been a visiting professor at the Harvard Medical School, at the University of Florida, and several other very prestigious uh, universities across the world. He's been honored for uh, research excellence by various societies, including the British Pharmacological Society, the Scottish Thoracic Society, the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, uh, the European Respiratory Society, and so on. Uh, he's going to talk, tell us about the clinical applications and future trends of airway oscillometry in asthma and COPD. And I'm, I can tell you that I am myself uh, very, very eager to listen to this presentation. Uh, but before I really invite him, uh, Professor Lipworth has requested me to uh, just put this uh, note uh, for all the attending delegates. Uh, Professor Brian Lipworth is looking for a clinical research fellow uh, starting in the third or the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, he's looking for somebody to be with him for two to three years <clears throat> and hopefully uh, get an MD degree uh, with the University of Dundee. Uh, he's hoping that uh, this work will give several high impact publications and he wants to look at uh, small airway outcome, outcomes in asthma and COPD, exactly the same thing that I sh shared with you in the last couple of slides. So here's a tremendous opportunity for somebody who has an MRCP or an equivalent, equivalent uh, qualification. And if you're interested, please uh, write an email to him at b.j.lipworth at uh, dundee.ac.uk. Uh, so with this, uh, Professor Lipworth, uh, it's a real uh, honor and a privilege to invite you to this uh, very important webinar. And I look forward uh, to your Thank you very much. Uh, just before Professor Lipworth starts, uh, there will be a question answer session at the end of this. So those of you all who would like to ask questions, please put them in the email that, uh, that is associated with this. I will read out all those questions at the end and I'll make sure that uh, these questions are answered by Professor Lipworth so that uh, you know, uh, all the doubts are clarified. If anybody of you all would like to have access uh, to the publications that Professor Lipworth uh, will refer to in his presentation, please ask us and especially uh, the Schiller group with Mahua, who is the point of contact, and she will certainly help you uh, get these, uh, the access to these full papers. So Professor Lipworth, uh, all over to you, and if you could start sharing your slides. Okay, can you, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Oh, okay, hold on, um, bear with me then. Um, let me just, hold on. Right, um, let's have a look where we're going wrong. Share the screen. Okay. Um. So whilst Professor, yes, Professor, Lippel, I think we're we are getting close. You got it now? No, no, no. So we, are, we can see you opening some files. Can you, can you see it now? The presentation no. is not yet uploaded, no. No, okay, all right, hold on a sec. I um, think it'll uh, happen. Yeah, it will, don't worry, no, no problem. Yeah. Um, Tell you what, stop sharing. Right, bear I, with it, me. Came and, it came and went. Yeah, don't worry. I, it's okay. I did have it up before, so we know it works. Right, share screen. Um, bear with me. Professor Lippert tells me it's minus two degrees in Dundee. And uh, so it was really cold out there. It is a bit. Right, bear <laughs> with me while I sort this out. Share screen. And bingo, how about that? 
That's right. So if you could. Right. Yeah, we all good yes. to go? Yes, okay. thank you very much. I look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much. To be honest, Sandeep, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really humbled by the, uh, by the kind words. And uh, I really enjoyed your talk, actually. Um, it, was, it was an excellent talk. And I feel very privileged to have listened to that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a talk that I would uh, I would love to steal and uh, and give to my medical students. Um, it was absolutely excellent. So that was a good start for me anyway, and I learned quite a few new things. So thank you very much. Uh, the other thing I would say is is that the the picture on the slide that you showed looks like my younger brother, but that's another story. Um, so um, it must have been taken a few years ago. So uh, what I want to talk about today is um applications and trends in airway oscillometry and asthma in cupd can i first of all just get rid of some um, nomenclature which can be confusing because um we're talking about airway oscillometry um impulse oscillometry and forced uh forced oscillation technique which are pretty much all of the same thing um and generally when we're talking about the forced oscillation technique or fot we can roughly divide that um, into um, airway oscillometry, um, AOS, or impulse oscillometry, IOS, which are measured using a similar but different uh, type of technique. So I just thought I'd clarify that in case anybody um, was, uh, was confused. Um, I prefer to use the, the term airway oscillometry because I think it's, it's, it's more, more descriptive. <laughs> So I'm briefly going to go over some uh, a brief overview of physiology, which will uh, uh, talk about some of the things which Sundeep um, has already illuminated. I'm going to talk about um, how we measure airway oscillometry and what outcomes we can ascertain. I'm then going to break that down separately into asthma and COPD, and then hopefully summarize. So let's get the ball rolling. Well, you've already seen a slide very similar to this from somebody. And I just want to reiterate that the um, airways bifurcate from the uh, trachea at the carina uh, about 23 times. And we can divide that into the larger airways, which are more than two millimeters in caliber, and the smaller airways, which are less than two millimeters. And in general, um, we can distinguish between the small and the large airways because that delineates airways from the eighth generation down to the 23rd generation. And as you've already heard, if you unraveled all of the airways from generation eight to 23, it would be the size of a tennis court. And if you unraveled all of the airways from the trachea down to generation eight, it would be the size of a beach towel. So that just tells you about the importance of the relative importance in terms of the available mucosal surface area of the small airways and the large airways. So if you're only measuring what's going on in the large airways, you're missing um, a very important part of the overall picture. So how do we assess the small airways? Um, and these are the techniques. This is a review that I wrote in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine about seven years ago now. Um, and there are several ways which you've already seen. Uh, most of these really are not practical for everyday practice. Um, so, you know, on a regular basis, we're not going to be doing multiple breath nitrogen washout. We're certainly not going to be putting an esophageal balloon down. We're probably not going to be doing high resolution CT scanning or hyperpolarized MRI. We're not going to be putting a bronchoscope down in the clinic and we're not gonna be doing induced sputum. So really the only two methods I think, which we could do on a regular basis, and in fact, which I do in every patient that walks through my door in the clinic, is firstly spirometry, and secondly, they all get um, airway oscillometry. So if we're talking about airway oscillometry in particular, um, how is this performed? So this is the device here. And if we then sort of take an X-ray of the device, um, this is what it looks like. You basically have the patient onto the mouthpiece. There is a vibrating mesh source. Conventional um, forced, forced oscillation techniques 
they use a loudspeaker and a loudspeaker, for example, if you look at the um, uh, Jaeger master screen device, the loudspeaker is very prone to harmonic distortion, which is not a good thing. This device here, this is the Thoracis tremor flow device. Um, this one has a vibrating mesh, which suffers very little in the way of harmonic distortion. And what it does um, is that it imparts um, an oscillation from the vibrating mesh, which is superimposed on the patient's quiet tidal breathing. So this is not an artificial forced expiratory maneuver all the way from total lung capacity to residual volume, which you do in spirometry, which of course is very artificial. This is just normal, quiet tidal breathing. If you can breathe normally, you can do this test. So even children below the age of five can do airway oscillometry. It requires very little in the way of cooperation, unlike spirometry. So you superimpose the um, oscillatory sound wave on top of the patient's normal quiet breathing pattern, and then the measured waveform then gets detected um, to measure something called the respiratory impedance. And the respiratory impedance is the sum of the resistance and the compliance in the lungs. Some people use the word reactance. You can use reactance and compliance synonymously. So let's see how this is done. So here you have, this is, uh, this is uh, one of our volunteers and you can see this is a portable handheld device. It's then connected up to a laptop um, and then the patient just breathes normally. And importantly, they have to compress their cheeks so that you don't get any artifact um, from, the, uh, from the upper airway in the mouth. And that's it. And then you just breathe normally with a nose clip on and it takes about 20 to 30 seconds to ascertain the, uh, the test. This is how you calibrate the device. It's very simple. You put this little uh, calibration device in which takes very little time and that calibrates your device. Whereas those of you who are using one of the old fashioned um, impulse oscillometers like the um, Jaeger master screen will know that you need a big three liter calibration syringe and it's a lot of hassle. So what are the advantages of airway oscillometry in real life? Well, it's portable. You can move it from room to room very easy. You can't do that with the master screen device. It's easy to calibrate, as we've said. It's very easy to maintain, much easier to maintain than the master screen. It's very user-friendly for the patient and the clinician. You don't get that horrible thump, thump, thump feeling that you get with a loudspeaker from the master screen device. And crucially, as far as I'm concerned as a clinician and someone who wants to access the data, which is the whole point of the exercise, is it's very friendly in terms of being PC friendly. So you can very easily export the data from this device, which you can't do with the master screen. The only thing you can do with the master screen is get the piece of paper and then manually put that into a database like Excel. So that's why we've actually switched. We used to use exclusively the Jaeger master screen and we've now switched almost exclusively to using the, um, the uh, uh, um, airway oscillometry device, the um, Thoris's tremor flow. So what sort of output do you get from this? Well, this is the, if you like, the raw output. And what you're measuring here is impedance. Impedance is simply um, the uh, pressure in centimeters of water or kilopascals. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, uh, divided, it's divided by the flow. So it's a pressure flow relationship. It's pressure divided by flow in liters per second. So it's either kilopascals per liter per second or centimeters of water per liter per second, pressure flow. And the pressure flow, the impedance, is then plotted against the frequency in hertz. So these are the frequency of the sound waves, which are superimposed on normal breathing. And there are two parts of the impedance, as I've already uh, told you. The first part, which is the in-phase part, is called the resistance, which is denoted by the letter R. Um, the most common thing that we measure is the 
low frequency resistance, which is R5 resistance at five Hertz, and the high frequency resistance, which is measured at 20 Hertz. Um, lower frequency sound waves can penetrate further and deeper into the lung. So the resistance at five Hertz is telling you about the resistance in the whole lung, all the way from the carina down to generation 23. Whereas R20, which is the resistance at the higher frequency of 20 Hertz, is telling you about the central airway or proximal airway resistance between the carina and generation eight. So by definition, if you subtract total airway resistance R5 from central airway resistance R20, you will get the peripheral airway resistance. So you'll see this term R5 minus R20 come up in the subsequent slide. Now, not only is there an in phase or positive part of this waveform, the respiratory impedance, but the respiratory impedance um, also, if you, if you like, um, has a sort of a younger brother or an out of phase reflection or echo. So think of this as the sort of the, the ping that you get as the reflected wave. And this interrupted line is known as the respiratory actance, denoted by the letter X. So this is the out of phase component of respiratory impedance. And this, the upper line, the solid line, is the in phase part of respiratory impedance, resistance and reactance. So with reactance, we can measure, firstly, we can measure the low frequency reactance at five Hertz, which is denoted by X5. And this tells you about the uh, stiffness or the compliance um, in the small airways of the lungs. Um, we can also measure something called the resonant frequency, which is where the reactance line crosses the zero for the impedance. And that's known as the resonant frequency. The other thing we can measure is the area under the curve between the reactants at 5 hertz, X5, and the resonant frequency shown by the, uh, by the hatched area here. And that's a, also a useful measure of what's going on in the small airways. Okay, so now you understand about the reactants, or if we like the compliance or the stiffness um, and the resistance, we can go on to look at some data. So this is a patient who came to, uh, came to my clinic uh, with severe asthma. Um, and um, what we did is we did the airway oscillometry reversibility to salbutamol. So here you can see the dark blue line. This is for the resistance. So we're starting with the positive curve. This is pre-bronchodilator and the lighter blue line is post-bronchodilator. This is the readout you actually get from the, from the thoracist tremor flow machine. And below that, the uh, negative part, this is the reactance or the capacitance, compliance, call it what you like. And in this case, the pre-bronchodilator again is the darker blue line and the post-bronchodilator is the light blue line. So you can see here that this patient was getting um, a significant degree or reversibility to inhaled salbutamol. So if we put some numbers on that, when we measured in the same patient at the same time of day, the patient had 16% reversibility for FFE1. When we measured the forced expiratory flow between 25 and 75% of forced fat capacity, known as the FEF25-75, which is a measure of volume dependent airway closure in the smaller airways, um, we saw a 15% change. Yet when we measure reversibility using resistance at five Hertz, we saw a much bigger change, 48%. Um, in the central airways, um, it was much less, and that's because asthma is the disease of the small airways, so it was only 23%. When we measured the smaller airways, the difference between R5 and R20, we saw a 75% change. When we measured the area under the reactance curve, that was 79%. And when we measured the uh, reactants at five Hertz, small airways compliance, we saw a 58% change. So I think this clearly shows that in patients with severe airway obstruction in asthma, um, we're seeing really big changes in response to uh, bronchodilators as beta agonists 
which you are less likely to detect using conventional spirometry. Even if you're measuring the FEF 2575, you won't get the same type of um, signal to noise ratio which you get in severe asthma. So then we, what we went on to do is we compared directly in the same patients head to head in a study where the patients measured simultaneously impulse oscillometry using the Jaeger master screen and um, airway oscillometry, um, AOS, using the thoracis tremor flow. So here you can see this is an Altman blonde curve, looking at the difference between the two devices, the difference between IOS and AOS, the two forced, os forced oscillation techniques, um, plotted against the mean of the Prost bronchodilator R5 on the left side, and plotted against the mean of the Prost bronchodilator um, reactance curve area on the right side. And we found some interesting observations. The first thing is that when you're looking at the resistance at five hertz, total airway resistance, then as you can see, values for impulse oscillometry tended to be higher than those for airway oscillometry. In fact, there was a 10% mean difference over, um, over the whole of these measurements. If you then compare the reactance area, AX, the area under the reactance curve between five hertz and the resonant frequency, then we saw the complete opposite. Whereas um, impulse oscillometry resistance was 10% higher, in this case, we found that the reactance was 65% higher for airway oscillometry with the tremor flow compared to um, impulse oscillometry using the master screen. And I think the reason that you're seeing this difference is that this reflects that measuring impulse oscillometry um, using the Jaeger device is actually under reading. So I think that the airway oscillometry with the um, tremor flow is giving you a much truer and more accurate reading. And that's down to the way the devices are calibrated. And that's why we have now moved over to using the thoracis tremor flow. And this has been shown to be the case um, using models of the bronchial tree um, that, um, uh, that the, um, the vibrating mesh with the uh, tremor flow is the much better and more accurate and sensitive device. So what about reversibility in asthma and COPD? Well, here's a paper that one of my uh, recent fellows, Chris Kuo, um, uh, he looked at reversibility to salbutamol in patients with asthma and COPD. And when you look at the FEV1, you really couldn't distinguish between the asthma and the COPD patients. They both had 8% reversibility to salbutamol. But in the same patients, when you use airway oscillometry and you measure the area under the reactance curve, now you can see what you would expect, that the asthmatic patients had about twofold greater reversibility to salbutamol compared to those with COPD. So I think that tells you something really important about the difference between doing a forced expiratory technique to measure the FEV1 and using a tidal breathing method um, to measure the area under the reactance curve. So what about um, airway oscillometry and severity of asthma? So this is a patient that we, this is a study that, again, one of my old fellows, Peter Williamson, published 10 years ago in lung. And this looks at um, the um, respiratory impedance, first as the total airway resistance, resistance at five hertz. And you can see that as you go from healthy volunteers to mild to moderate asthma to severe asthma, then you can see there's a progressive increase in the total error resistance. But here is a really important learning point, because if you look at central or proximal error resistance as the resistance at 20 hertz, as you compare healthy volunteers, mild to moderate asthma and severe asthma, there's no difference in the central airway resistance. And I think that teaches very loud and clear that asthma is first and foremost a disease of the small airways. And when you subtract 
the total area resistance R5 from the center area resistance R20, in other words, R5, R20, you can see that when you go from healthy to mild to moderate asthma to severe asthma, there is a marked increase in peripheral airway resistance. And you see the same thing for peripheral airway reactants, which is the reactance X measured at the low frequency of five Hertz. So I think that's a really telling slide, um, which teaches that um, when you're looking at asthma, you should really be focusing on the small airways because that's where most of the disease is. So this is another study where we looked at 378 patients with asthma across British Thoracic Society steps two, three, and four, which are pretty much the same as the genus steps two, three, and four. Um, the first thing to notice is that when you compare these patients and you look at their FAV1, step two, 90% mean, step three, 86% mean, and step four, 84% mean, there really wasn't that much difference in FAV1. So if you compare step two to step four, there was only a 6% predicted difference in FAV1. If you look at these, the individual data plots for each patient, if you look at the plots for um, the um, difference between R5 and R20, the peripheral air resistance, so these are the individuals and these are the means and the confidence intervals superimposed. Um, you can see that um, even at step two patients, um, that step two patients had 65% of abnormal values for R5, R20. And the abnormal value is delineate, delineated by this interrupted line here. So despite the fact that these patients had a pretty normal F of E1, you can see that over 60% had abnormal small airway resistance. The figure for step three patients was again about 64%, and that jumps up to 70% abnormal values for R5, R20, as you can see here quite clearly in step four patients. So this tells you across the uh, BTS treatment steps that measuring um, airway oscillometry is more sensitive than measuring spirometry using the FAV1. Um, we then went on to do another study. This is from Arvin Manoharan, um, one of my fellows who's now the lead for severe asthma um, at the uh, Manchester Institute at Salford Royal Infirmary, um, is that we found when we screened our database, our NHS and research database, that we found that 302 out of 40, 442 patients with asthma, this was across BTS steps two to four, 60% of these mild to moderate patients had a preserved FAV1. And by preserved FAV1, we define that as more than 80% predicted. In fact, their mean FAV1 was 97% predicted. So nearly what? Uh, over two thirds of these patients had a preserved FAV1. In these patients who had a preserved FAV1, of those 302 patients, 45% had abnormal airway oscillometry defined by R5, R20. So even in the presence of a normal F of E1, these patients have evidence of persistent small airways dysfunction, nearly half the patients. So don't be fooled if your patient has a normal F of E1, because that does not mean that they have normal airways physiology. So what does it mean if you've got abnormal physiology? Does it mean anything at all? Well, what we did here is that we then linked that same database and Arvin went on to link it with health informatics. And what I mean by that is each patient in Scotland has a unique um, community health index or CHI number, which is a unique identifier. And using that, you can then link them to outcomes like prescribing of the number of salbutamol canisters they get or the number of bursts of um, oral steroids. So this enabled us to link in a very sensitive and accurate fashion whether if a patient has 
at our normal FEF2575 from spirometry, which we defined as being less than 70% of predicted, or our normal R5, R20, more than 0.07 per kilopascal. By the way, if you want to convert that to centimeters of more water, just multiply it by 10. So that would be 0.07 kilopascals per liter um, per second, or it would be um, 0.7 centimeters of water per liter per second. So what we found is that patients who had um, an abnormal FEF2575 um, were twice as likely to require salbutamol use over a two-year period, and patients who had an abnormal R5R20 were also uh, twice as likely to require more salbutamol. And the interesting thing is that when you combine those patients with an abnormal FEF2575 who also had an abnormal R5, R20, so in other words, when both of these parameters were abnormal, then the odds ratio jumped up to three. And when you look at steroid use, it's a very similar pattern. An increased likelihood of steroid use with an abnormal FEF2575, the same with R5, R20, but when you combine the two, then you can see the odds ratio, the likelihood of requiring steroids over that two year period. So we're looking at long-term control here, um, jumps up. So the conclusion that we drew from that is that if you really want to fully characterize your patients, and if you want to predict how much reliever use they're using or how many steroid bursts, then you really need to use the combination of spirometry and impulse oscillometry together. I think that's the teaching point from that particular slide. You know, and these weren't, these weren't mild patients, even though they had a preserved FV1. I mean, look, they're in held steroid dose. Their mean was 800 micrograms a day, Beclomethor's own equivalent, and over 42% of them were long-acting beta agonists. So, you know, it's not like these were mild asthmatics. So how does airway oscillometry relate to asthma control? So in this case, these patients had a mean FEV1, just to calibrate you, of 87%. Their mean beclomethasone equivalent ICS dose was 620. 65% were on LABA, 11% were on LAMA, and 37% were on leukotriene receptor antagonists. So here we have the asthma control questionnaire score. So just to refresh your memory, in case you've forgotten, an ACQ score of more than 1.5 means that you've got poor control, and an ACQ score of less than 0.75 means that you've got good control. So what we found is that um, when we looked at the reactance area, um, and we looked at the reactance area of less than one versus greater than one, we found that was highly discriminating in terms of the asthma control questionnaire. So in other words, if you've got non-compliant stiff lungs, you've got a much higher ACQ score. And the difference between the two groups, between the groups who had normal compliance and abnormal compliance, that difference was nearly one. And the other thing that I should have told you is that the minimal clinical important difference in the ACQ score is 0.5. So that is a clinically relevant difference there in the ACQ score. So having stiff lungs is bad news. If you've got um, high airway resistance, um, in this case, we measure the difference between resistance at five hertz at 19 hertz. It's much the same thing as R5, R20, um, give or take one hertz. There's no difference between the two, to be honest. Um, Again, if you look at patients who've got a high peripheral airway resistance, then that also means that they've got much worse control. And the difference there between the low resistance and the high resistance group was greater than 0.5, a clinically relevant difference. We saw the same thing um, with FEV1 comparing less than 80 and more than 80% predicted, but you can see the significance level wasn't as high. And when we looked at FEF25, 75% predicted, Again, we found a difference, but again, it wasn't as significant. So I think that tells you very clearly 
that measuring peripheral airway compliance as AX or peripheral airway resistance as R519 or R5, R20 um, is very close related to asthma control. Why is the ACQ score important? I'll tell you why. Because the ACQ score is probably the strongest single predictor of whether a patient will have a subsequent exacerbation. And that was shown in the gold study by Eric Bateman. So if you're sitting there in the clinic and you want to predict whether a patient's going to exacerbate over the next 12 months, um, the ACQ score is a very strong predictor. So in other words, this is a marker of exacerbations as well as control. Now, we all know these days that asthma is involved with type two inflammation um, involving cytokines IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. So here we have a study in persistent asthmatics with a mean ICS dose of 600 micrograms. These were our patients. Again, it was Chris Kuo who analyzed the data for me uh, with a pretty well-preserved FEV1 of 89%. But despite having a preserved FEV1, you can see there was a disconnect in the fact that the ACQ score was 1.41. Remember that threshold for poor control was 1.5. So these patients were not well controlled. Certainly their ACQ was above the 0.75 threshold for optimal control. So let's dig deeper into the data. If your peripheral bloody eosinophil count is more than 300, in other words, if you've got significant type 2 bloody eosinophilia, you can see that means that you've got stiffer lungs. The difference um, in AX comparing, these are the uh, means and standard errors comparing two and one, highly significant. So you can see there that having type two inflammation means that you have stiffer lungs um, in the lung periphery. And it's the same thing for the R5, R20. If your eosinophil counts more than 300, then you have a higher peripheral airway resistance. And if your eosinophils are more than 300, then unsurprisingly, you also are more likely to be atopic. You've got a much higher total IgE. And if your eosinophils are more than 300, as expected, as Sundeep's already told you, then you'll have a higher exhaled breath nitric oxide. So we put these two in, the Ig and the pheno, just to make sure that you know, we were calibrating the patients correctly because you'd expect to find that eosinophilia is associated with a higher pheno and a higher IgE. But what we didn't know, which we thought was interesting, is that if you've got type two inflammation, it means that you've got lungs which are more resistive and which are less compliant in the periphery. So we've talked about asthma. I think I've pretty much exhausted that. Um, let's move on to talk about COPD as well. So what is the archetypical small airway COPD phenotype, which you and I see in the clinic? Well, the first thing is these patients have often got hyperinflation, which is evident as an increase in total lung capacity, which you would measure with either helium or nitrogen washout or with the body plethysmograph. Using those same techniques, the patients will have evidence of gas trapping. In other words, they have a high residual volume, and when the residual volume is high, then the force vital capacity will be reduced. If you measure um, uh, airway oscillometry, these patients will have a high peripheral airway resistance and they'll also have a reduced um, reactance at five hertz and a raised reactance area. And if you were very keen and you did, you did multiple breath nitrogen washout, you would show that they have ventilation heterogeneity in terms of raised um, asana and conductive uh, component. And if you went up to do a high resolution CT scan, you would see they would have increased lucency in terms of increased low attenuation areas. So that's your typical um, COPD phenotype. So what about airway oscillometry? What's the relationship of resistance R and compliance X to COPD severity? These are probably the best data that I can share with you in over 2000 patients from the, this is the Eclipse cohort, which you may have read about. So this is a cross-sectional study. And here you can see they looked at patients in gold two, gold three, and gold four. 
And the thing I want you to notice here is that although the peripheral area resistance, R5, R20, does increase from 0.15 in gold 2 to 0.2 in gold 3 to 0.24 in gold 4, that increase really isn't that dramatic. So there is an increase in peripheral area resistance, but it's not really a game changer. But when you look at the peripheral airway compliance, the area under the reactance curve, AX, you can see this really jumps up from gold two to gold three to gold four. So if we quantify that, if you look at the percentage difference comparing gold group four versus gold group two, whereas you see a 60% difference in peripheral resistance, you see 136% difference in peripheral airway compliance. In other words, you get a much better readout from lung compliance or lung stiffness and COPD than you do from lung resistance. In other words, there's a relative discordance or disconnect between resistance and compliance or stiffness according to COPD severity. So let me just give you a, a case study, an anecdotal case study. So this um, is a typical kind of Scottish person who comes to the clinic. Yes, we do have patients who have a 75 year pack history. That's fairly common. Um, it's a very poor area um, with large degree of unemployment. It's a 74 year old man who smoked most of his life from when he was a child. He's now getting breathless up inclined. When we listen with the stethoscope, in keeping with emphysema, he had reduced air entry in his upper zones. His chest X-ray, to be honest, to my eye, was normal. He uh, was starting to get on the slippery slope of hypoxia in terms of his oxygen saturation. Not yet at the level where he needs long-term domiciliary, but certainly uh, on his way. Because he's a smoker and because he doesn't have type 2 inflammation, his exhaled nitric oxide is low. And he also has low eosinophils as well. Now, you can see here that we did the spirometry at baseline and 15 minutes after salbutamol. And what I want you to notice here, which is not uncommon, is that the pre versus post bronchodilator FV1 is actually lower. The patient didn't bronchodilate. And the reason for that is that patients with, F, with uh, COPD, with severe airflow obstruction, when they do a repeated forced expiratory maneuver, they get effort dependent worsening in their FV1, which you can see here. And you see the same, albeit to a lesser degree, with the forced vital capacity. In contrast, we saw marked reversibility in the total airway resistance, 35%, peripheral airway reactance, X5 at 53%, and also peripheral airway reactants as the area under the reactance curve as 79%. So if you were evaluating this patient, you would say, well, there's no evidence of reversibility here, but that's because you're using an unphysiological method, spirometry, um, which um, involves um, dynamic airway closure and volume dependent airway closure. And that's why you can be missing potential reversibility if you're using spirometry. So I think that's an important teaching case there. The final uh, two slides I want to show you, uh, what happens to um, airway oscillometry when you bronchoconstrict a patient with COPD? So this is, like, this is like a bronchial challenge test for COPD in the same way that you would do a methacholine challenge test for asthma. So what we did with, this, with these patients these patients were all on ICS lava, like fluticasone, salmetro, baclomethasone, fulmotrol, that kind of thing at baseline. And then we gave them a carvidolol challenge. Carvidolol is a non-selective um, beta blocker, um, which is used for the treatment of heart failure. So it's a bit like propranolol, but it's longer acting. So we continued them on the ICS lava, and then we measured them again after a week while they were taking the ICS lava in conjunction with the non-selective beta blocker. And then finally, we then, after another week, we stopped the lava, we continued on the inhaled steroid, and we continued on the non-selective beta blocker. So this was a beta blocker challenge here, 
at the first time point, and at the second time point, this was a lava withdrawal challenge, if you like. That's the way I look at this data. And this is Sonny Jabal, who's uh, one of my research fellows who's now moved to Edinburgh. So let me walk you through this, because I think it's really intriguing, actually. If you look at the FFE1, when you give them a non-selected beta blocker, you can see that there's about a 10% fall in FFE1, pretty much what you'd expect. And when you withdraw the lava, you get a further small decline. It was about 2 or 3% fall in FFE1. So that's there. If you look at the central or proximal area resistance at 20 hertz, if you give them a beta blocker, nothing happens. If you stop the lava, nothing happens. So I think that teaches you very clearly that it's really the small airways which are the important part um, in terms of uh, uh, airway physiology in patients with COPD. I think that's a really important slide there. If you look at the resistance at five hertz, the total air resistance, if you beta block them, you can see the airway resistance jumps up by about 30%. Um, and then when you withdraw the lava, it doesn't really change that much. If you look at the peripheral airway compliance, you can see that that changes to a greater degree than R5. And when you stop the lava, there's a small increase, but you know it's not, it's not really large. Now, check out what happens with the area under the reactant curve. Oops, my bad. If you look what happens when you give them the beta blocker challenge, look at this. Look at what happens to the peripheral lung stiffness. It goes up by 120%. And then after the beta blocker challenge, if you then stop the lava, you can see the lung compliance changes by um, another 100%. So again, I think this tells you that there's a relative discordance or disconnect between resistance and compliance in patients with COPD. This is really one of my favorite teaching slides, actually. What about if you give a patient with COPD a bronchodilator? Well, um, if you look at the total air resistance, if you give them teotropium, it falls. If you give them a long acting beta agonist, this was tolobuterol added to teotropium, it falls again. And if you look at the central area resistance, R20, it doesn't change at all. So again, this is telling you that it's not the central airways which determine the bronchodilator response to a muscarinic antagonist or a beta agonist. It's all happening in the small airways. If you look at the area under the reactance curve, the peripheral lung compliance, then you can see the changes are really dramatic as in the previous slide. Give them teotropium, a marked fall in um, uh, airway reactants. In other words, a large increase in compliance. Reactants and compliance are reciprocal. And then if you give them a long acting beta agonist, then there's a further fall here. So this tells you that the effects of long acting bronchodilators in COPD are working in the small, but not the large airways. So let's briefly tie up and just briefly compare and contrast spirometry and airway oscillometry. So these are the outputs, which you already know. They've both got a pretty good signal to noise ratio. Um, I would say spirometry is not patient friendly because there's about 20 to 30% of patients who just can't do spirometry, but I've never found anyone that can't do airway oscillometry. And I've already said kids of less than five years old can easily do this. If you can breathe normally, then you can do airway oscillometry. Spirometry is not physiological, whereas airway oscillometry is. Spirometry well, it'll tell you a bit about the small airways if you measure FEF 2575, um, whereas airway oscillometry is really the only technique which will comp compartmentalize accurately between the small and the large airways. Cost-wise, well, I guess spirometry is still cheaper than airway oscillometry, but that will change um, as we move forwards, I guess. They're both portable um, and they're both FDA approved. So just to wrap up in my final slide, the first point I'd like to make is that airway oscillometry is a physiological effort independent rapid test um, which can easily measure resistance and compliance. Second point is airway oscillometry 
um, using the Thoracis Tremor Flow is a modern, portable, user-friendly device for the operator and the patient to measure resistance and compliance and to compartmentalize that between the proximal and the distal airways. The third point, airway oscillometry is useful to detect small airways dysfunction. And in the clinic, we mostly use the area under the reactance curve, AX, and the peripheral airway resistance, R5, R20, in asthmatic patients with a preserved FFV1. And you've already seen that if your patients have a preserved FFV1, in about half the cases, they will have undetected small airways dysfunction. Fourth point, the AX and the R5, R20, as you saw from um, uh, Arvind Manoharan's data and from Chris Kuo's data, um, they are closely related to asthma control and also crucially related to type two inflammation. Fifth point, lung compliance measured as the area under the reactance curve, AX, is more sensitive than resistance as R5 or indeed R5, R20 in patients with COPD. And my final point is that airway oscillometry, I think, should not be used in isolation. I think it should only be used in conjunction with spirometry. I want to emphasize that to fully characterize the physiology of your patients with asthma and COPD. So thank you very much for your attention. And again, just to remind you that if there are any young uh, pulmonologists out there who uh, want to come and train in Dundee for two to three years, it'll probably be quarter three or quarter four. Once we get this COVID thing hopefully out of the way, then if you want to make a preliminary inquiry, then please do that. And thank you very much for taking your time uh, to listen to me on a Saturday, because I know that there is obviously pressure on family time, etc. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Professor Lippert, for an absolutely amazing presentation. Uh, clearly, one of the presentations that has clarity of thought. You have wonderful data to support all the statements that you have made. <clears throat> and it also brings about the tremendous clinical application of the use of uh, air oscillometry in your practice. And I think uh, there's so many brilliant takeaways from your presentation. And I'm sure all the delegates who have been listening to this must have found this very useful. Okay. I have been getting a lot of, a lot of questions. And so uh, uh, if I can get started with that as soon as possible so that we can get, uh, you know, as many clarifications and questions sorted out that have come from the audience. Uh, the first question that came was, what is the fundamental difference between an impulse oscillometry and an airway oscillometry technique or a force oscillation technique? Okay, so the impulse oscillometry technique, firstly, it uses an old fashioned loudspeaker. Yeah, I mean, this technique was actually first described by Ronald Dubois in 1953 when it used a loudspeaker. Well, you know, technology's moved on now. We have computers, mobile phones, and that's why when Thoracis developed the tremor flow, they started from scratch. So instead of using a loudspeaker, which has got harmonic dis distortion, they used a, uh, a much better calibrated method using a vibrating mesh, which doesn't have the same degree of harmonic distortion. So that's really, that's really the main difference. And there are, there are also differences that you've seen in the way the device is calibrated as well. And that's why we, we think in terms of signal to noise ratio, harmonic distortion, um, that we think that the uh, the uh, airway oscillometry, AOS, um, or airflow oscillometry, call it what you like, is, um, is the way to go compared to the old-fashioned impulse oscillometry. So let's get this straight. Am I suggesting to you all that if you've already got a Jaeger master screen, you should go and put it in the bin? No. If it's working, then keep using it. But bear in mind that there are other methods available. So if that's what you're using and it's still working, then keep using it until it stops working. I can tell you from personal experience that Jaeger, they're now part of the, uh, uh, the Viasis healthcare group, they no longer support the master screen. They don't in the UK, I don't know if they do in India. So when your master screen goes down, that's the end of it. 
it won't work. So if you are looking to either replace your master screen or if you've not got any forced oscillation technique, then I would say to you, hand on heart, the best, the best available method. And we've also evaluated other forced oscillation techniques, which I didn't have time to tell you about um, today. Um, that if you are going to do that, the way to go for the reasons I've already outlined um, would be the uh, would be the standalone thoracic tremor flow for those reasons. But if you've got a machine that's working, <coughs> keep using it until it stops working. But then you'll find that the company won't support it, and that's exactly what we found recently. They're not interested anymore. They're not developing the device. <coughs> is there any patient discomfort that is observed while performing we, this test? We, well, we find that with the Jaeger Master Screen with the loudspeaker. There is quite a bit of discomfort in terms of the thumping sound of the loudspeaker. Yeah, I mean, on a relative scale of discomfort of one to 10, I think, you know, it's like a two or a three, to be honest with you. But patients do say they don't like it. <coughs> with the vibrating mesh, it's really, really much more uh, patient friendly and patients hardly notice it at all. And it's much quicker. Um, instead of, say, a, a 40 to 60 second signal acquisition period with the um, IOS device, the Jaeger device, with the Tremorflow device, it's about 20 seconds. Okay. Uh, quite a few other questions. I mean, uh, Brian, you, you talked a lot about the differences between lung compliance and lung resistance in COPD. Now, this is a game changer for us because, you know, with spirometry, the only, the only concept that we get is this is an obstructive airway disease. There's an airway obstruction, that's all. But are you telling, are you suggesting that with the airway oscillometry technique, you're not only seeing the airway obstruction, but you're also seeing the lung compliance component of it, which spirometry does not tell you. Because this, is, this is something very different, very new. Yeah, you're quite right. So spirometry will tell you about the airflow obstruction by measuring you know, the forced expiratory ratio, the ratio of FV1 to FVC. It will spirometry, to be fair, it will tell you about gas trapping because the degree of reduction in the force factor capacity from predicted normal is directly <coughs> related to the degree of gas trapping in terms of residual volume. So I've already said, when your residual volume is high, you get a proportionate reduction of the force factor capacity, which you don't usually see in asthma. You know, in asthma, most patients with asthma, unless they've got airway remodeling, they don't have gas trapping and the force factor capacity is preserved. So you do see you will get some evidence of small airways disease in spirometry in terms of the um, reduction of the force fight capacity. And actually, if you do a relaxed vital capacity, a slow vital capacity, or, or relaxed, call it what you like, in COPD, um, and then you subtract the relaxed vital capacity from the force fight capacity, that will also give you a reasonable index of the amount of gas trapping as well. We, we've published data on that before. But... I digress there. The point is, is that the only technique really which will tell you about lung compliance or lung stiffness is using um, airway oscillometry um, to determine either the reactance at five hertz or the area under the reactance curve AX. And I think that's something which is, which is really, really telling. And if you look at the response to treatment, as you've already seen, from the bronchodilator studies with teotropium and tolobuterol, or the bronchoconstriction studies with um, carvedilol and laba withdrawal, that really does show you that you're getting deflation of the lung um, um, when, uh, when you're giving bronchodilators, which you really don't pick up to the same degree with spirometry. And that's why that you can give someone, you know, a laba lama for example, in COPD, and you measure their FV1, it doesn't really change very much. And the patient comes back to see you and says, you know, doctor, it's been a complete game changer. I can now walk a mile, whereas before I could only walk 400 yards. And you look at your chart and you say, well, your FV1, you know, it's, it's changed from, it's gone from 40% predicted to 42% predicted. But when you look at the AX, you'll find in that patient you know, the, the X will change by 40 or 50%. And the reason is, is that when you're giving the long acting bronchodilators in COPD, you're deflating the lung 
So you're making the lungs less stiff. And that means that the patient can breathe at a better mechanical advantage with deflated lungs. And that's something that you can only pick up. And I think it's really useful because when the patient comes back to me, I can say to them, well, you know, that's really interesting because I can see that your lung stiffness has improved by 40%. And the patients really appreciate being told that, that, you know, your lungs are less stiff, you're breathing at a better mechanical advantage. And if you give that positive feedback to patients, you know what? They're more likely to adhere to their treatment in the long term if you give them positive reinforcement. You know, it's like the carrot and the stick. If you, if you give a dog a treat while you're training it, it's likely, you know, to give you its paw and sit down. And it's the same thing with patients. Patients, patients like positive reinforcement. So if you say to a patient, I've given you this treatment and it's reduced, you know, it's improved your lung compliance. Well, I use the word lung compliance. I use the word lung stiffness because they understand that. Then they go, oh, right. Well, I think, you know what? I think I'll continue to taking that treatment because I can see what, what good it's doing me. And you can actually show them the tracing on the area under the reactance curve. And if you trace around it, you can actually show them how much they've improved, which is a really good visual to a patient to reinforce um, why it's important they should take their treatment. So it's a very good educational tool for patients. Absolutely brilliant, Brian. I think, uh, so I, I, I'm looking at this as a completely new application in clinical practice. Uh, I mean, the, the whole understanding of obstructive airway disease is only obstruction, uh, whereas this is giving you a completely new dimension to look into. And that has perhaps a lot more clinical application than what just looking at the obstructive elements as well. Uh, Dr. Murli Mohan, who who worked with you quite a few years. Oh, right. Ah, yes. So he, he's asked two questions. Actually, I'll, if Murl is there, I'll tell him that I still have the tie that is in my wardrobe there. I still wow. have the tie that he <laughs> kindly gave me once when he came back from India. I'm sure he's smiling now, but I, I still have it wear it. So um, I'm sure I'm he's smiling. You again today. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, he said, great to hear from you again. Uh, two questions for you in the COVID pandemic. One, is airway oscillometry safer than spirometry? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, because it's not, it's not aerosol, Jerry. It's, it's tidal breathing, yeah. Okay. Second, would the data you show make a stronger case for use of extra fine particle corticosteroids in patients with COPD? So do you think it's a game changer in terms of, uh, you know, the whole pharmacotherapy uh, could potentially change because of the fact that you're now talking about small airways obstruction in both asthma and COPD. And we know that the standard inhaled corticosteroids uh, have a particle MMAD of two to five microns. They, they may not necessarily be reaching the small airways in sufficient amounts. Do you think that uh, you know, this whole thing could change or revolutionize the way we treat COPD with inhaled steroids or asthma, the small airways disease phenotype of asthma? Well, I didn't have the time to go through that today. Otherwise, I'd still be talking. And maybe, maybe if the uh, Indian Chess Society wants to invite me back, again, I'd be happy to give a separate talk looking at the impact of different treatments on small airways outcomes. So, Murali, yeah, the answer to that is definitely yes. So what we've shown, and others have shown, is that if you compare conventional uh, particle formulations for example, of inhaled steroid in asthma with a, with a particle size with an MMAD um, of, say, 2.5 to 3 microns, and you compare that to an extra fine particle formulation of uh, inhaled steroid with an MMAD of 1 micron, um, then you get marked improvements in small airways outcomes. And it's actually also been shown with bronchodilators as well. Um, Arvind Manoharan, one of my previous fellows who's now in Manchester at the Salford Lung Centre, he published a seminal paper in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology a few years back comparing bronchodilators with different particle size and again showed that there was a marked improvement in both resistance and compliance in asthma. So look, if you think, forget all of that, if you said to me and I say to my patients, when my patients come back and they haven't responded, to a coarse particle inhaler, whether it be an ICS or, or a LABA, um, 
And I say to them, look, I'm going to switch you to an extra fine particle formulation of an ICS or an ICS ladder. And the way that I explain it to them is that if you compare the size, I, you know, I, if I tell them it's two microns against five microns, they don't understand that. So what I say to them is that I'm going to change the formulation. And instead of delivering, uh, you know, particles the size of a football, I'm going to be delivering particles uh, the size of a golf ball. And that means the particles are going to penetrate deeper into the lungs. So assuming the cost is the same, why would I use a formulation of inhaled steroid or ICS lava, which only reaches part of the lung, part of the inflammatory wall paint? It would be as stupid as inviting someone to come in and decorate my study, you can't see my study because I've got a background because it's a horrible mess. It's not as tidy as yours, I'll give you that. But if I said to a decorator to come in and said, could you decorate the wall? And he came in and a week later I came back to inspect the work and I said to the decorator, I said, hey, there's a problem here. And I, he says, well, what's that? I said, you only painted a third of the wall. And he said, well, that's all I could do. So that's the same analogy in terms of painting the inflammatory wallpaper. Why would you use a formulation which is only going to reach the proximal airways when you can use a formulation which can reach the whole lung? So I almost exclusively now, to answer your question, I can't see why you would ever use a coarse particle formulation if you have a small particle formulation, or an extra fine, call it what you want, of the same class of drug. It makes no sense at all. What I would say that to date, the evidence is better in asthma for extra fine particle formulations than it is in COPD. But by the time I get my next research fellow in quarter three, quarter four, then we might also have the answer in COPD as well, because that's the project that we're attempting to do. Excellent. <clears throat> Very quick answers, Brian, because we are falling into a little short of time. Uh, there are four questions that I think are very, very important. Can you differentiate be the, between the two phenotypes of COPD, the chronic bronchitic phenotype and the emphysematous phenotype using the AOS? Um, you, can, you can to a degree in that the emphysematous phenotype will have a disproportionate increase in, um, in AX compared to R5. Okay? There'll be a much greater discordance in the emphysematous phenotype than in the chronic bronchitis phenotype. Can I mean, you can actually, to be honest with you though, you can, you can get that information with a stethoscope just by listening to the chest and the emphysematous <laughs> phenotype will have poor air entry. So you probably don't need an impulse oscillometer to tell <laughs> you that. Okay. Can, you, can, you, can you differentiate between asthma and COPD using this AOS? Um, can you just, no, you can't really, um, because you could have, uh, here's the dilemma for me in the clinic is we have very heavy smokers who are smoking asthmatics, yeah? And how would you differentiate that from a COPD? I think that's the germane question here. Um, and the answer is really, it's very difficult. If someone smoked all their life, they may well have, they may well have had an asthma phenotype and they, you know, they're a smoking asthmatic with type two inflammation, or they could have COPD and have type two inflammation. But to be honest with you, it doesn't really interest me because at the end of the day, whether you're a smoking asthmatic or whether you're a smoker with COPD, what determines the response to treatment of particularly inhaled steroids is whether you've got the type 2 phenotype in terms of having a peripheral bloody eosinophil count more than 300 cells per microliter. That's what determines whether you're going to have reduced exacerbations um, um, in response to taking um, inhaled corticosteroids. So I don't, I don't really care. So, you know, what really matters is whether A, whether you've got high acidophils and B, whether you're a frequent exacerbator. So two more questions, Brian. I think we're falling just short of time. Are there reference values for AOS? Uh, do you need to generate the reference values for each individual uh, region or country? I, I, in your presentation, I did not see percentage predicted values for R5 minus R20 or the AX, you use absolute values. So do you believe that there are absolute cutoff values, single cutoff values that 
differentiate between normal and abnormal, unlike what we do with spirometry, where we tend to use the percentage predicted values to differentiate between normal and abnormal. Well, the machines, the, um, the Thoracist Channel Flow and the Jaeger Master Screen will give you percent predicted values. But to be honest with you, I don't find them particularly useful. And in any case, when I'm seeing patients, what's more important to me is the change or in response to intervention between subsequent clinic visits. That's what's important, okay? So it's the within subject change. But here's my, here's my rule of thumb, which is what I published in The Lancet in 2014, is that my rule of thumb is if your total error resistance, R5, is more than 0.5 kilopascals per liter per second, yeah, which is five centimeters of water, multiply it by 10. To me, that means it's abnormal. If your I5 R20, this is in adults, not kids, because kids have higher values. In adults, <clears throat> if your R5 R20, <clears throat> excuse me, is greater than 0.1 kilopascal per liter per second, which is one centimeters of water, that is abnormal. <clears throat> And in adults, if your AX is more than one kilopascal per litre, which is 10 centimetres of water per litre, that is abnormal as well. So those are the numbers that I, I keep in my mind when I'm in the clinic. And then also, um, we then serially plot on the computer the uh, differences in response to interventions um, when we're treating patients in a clinic, whether it be changing formulation to an extra fine, or whether we're using biologics. You know, Brian, what this reminds me of is for spirometry, you need to have the age, gender, height, ethnicity. Uh, yeah. Unlike what we do for blood pressure or for blood sugar, what you're telling me is using fixed cutoff values, like how do we differentiate between hypertension or uh, high blood sugar for diabetes? You know, this, I think, simplifies the way you treat a, you, 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 you make an interpretation of the report. Uh, unlike spirometry, where it, you know so much of it depends on so many factors, uh, whereas I believe uh, airway oscillometry gives you just like the cutoff values, like you have for hypertension. Above that is abnormal, below that is normal. I think that's going to simplify a lot of clinical practice, if if what you're saying is true. That's a good point. Yeah, I like the way yeah. you put that. Actually. Yeah. yeah. The last question, uh, Brian, is there a role for AOS in interstitial lung disease? Can yes, you, there is. Yeah, can, there can is you help because... diagnose? Can you help uh, follow up these cases uh, uh, to look at response to therapy? Well, it's not as well, it's not as well established as um, measuring spirometry or static lung volumes in, in ILD. Um, there's not as much data out there, not the same density of literature. But, um, but there's no question that um, if, you do, if you do serially follow patients with, uh, with IPF, then you can see changes in lung compliance. The main one to follow in IPF, obviously resistance doesn't change, that's a given. Um, so the main one to follow would be AX. That's the one with the best signal to noise ratio. However, what we don't have is all of the pivotal studies, um, like with Nintendinab and Perfenidone, they follow force fighter capacity. So there's no serial evaluation from large scale randomized controlled trials with um, either AOS or IOS. But yes, you can, you, can, you can certainly detect impressive changes in AX. In fact, to a much greater degree than you can with force five capacities oh. when you're following patients with IPF or any ILD, you know, whether it be sarcoid or hypersensitive pneumonitis, yeah. I think with this, uh, Brian, we would come to the end of this wonderful webinar. Uh, I think these are exciting times ahead. What you have presented is uh, very futuristic. Uh, is, is an instrument that gives you a lot more information than what spirometry does. It does not generate any aerosol. So in the COVID times, it would perhaps be the most important diagnostic test that you can use in a clinic. Uh, a simple test that does not require any effort from the patient's point of view. Uh, by and large, I think it also gives you additional information than what spirometry does. So I'm very excited about the and uh, I think uh, the future of uh, you know these uh, the, the future in the in the in the chest clinic uh, for a respiratory physician is going to be I think much greater than what we had today. Uh, thank you for an absolutely excellent presentation. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to listen to you, and there's so much to learn from you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Professor Brian Lipworth for this uh, wonderful day. I would like to express my very sincere thanks to uh, Thoracis and Shilla for having supported this event and the Indian Chess Society for having accredited this uh, very important educational activity. So with this, we would come to an end. Uh, thank you very much to all the delegates who have uh, joined, uh, joined us today. And I hope that uh, you know, today's uh, presentation is going to be a game changer for many of us who practice respiratory medicine. Uh, so with this, thank you very much and uh, good night. Uh, have a wonderful weekend ahead. Can I just say one thing is that Please. I, write, I write a regular blog on respiratory medicine in LinkedIn. So before you go, if you want to scan the QR code in the top corner, that will take you directly to the LinkedIn site and you might find that blog of interest. If you want excellent, to excellent. So I think we would, we would hold that on for a few seconds, uh, but I'm sure a lot of us would directly go to your LinkedIn uh, website, to your LinkedIn site, uh, uh, Brian. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, so with this, we conclude. And I hope, uh, Brian, that we get to see each other some, at some point of time soon. And uh, hope that you can come to India to share your you know, more knowledge that you would be, you would have earned uh, in this very exciting field. Okay. Thank you and good night. Take care all, stay safe. Bye then.